All right, I'm gonna go find my little announcement. Nine o'clock comes quick. <laughs> sure does. <laughs> it does. Uh, Sonia, you're muted. Oh. Thanks. So we, we're live, Senator, whenever you're ready. All right, I've got to get to my announcement. Good morning, everyone. I'm Senator Bob Guida from District 2. Uh, today, we'll be holding a meeting of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Before we get started, I want to read through a checklist to ensure that everyone uh, in the meeting is aware that we're holding it in compliance with the right to know law. <clears throat> so as chair of the Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that we're providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We're utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting all members of the committee and selected legislative staff do have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom or YouTube via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We're providing, I'm sorry, we've provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. We're providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone does have a problem, please email remotesenate at leg.state.nh.us or call 603-271-6931. It's 271-6931. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, it'll be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call of attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state where they are and if anyone else is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. I'll call the roll. Senator D'Alessandro. I'm Senator D'Alessandro, District 20. I'm in my home in Manchester and I'm alone. My wife is in the house. Senator Daniels. Senator Gary Daniels, I'm at my state house office and my assistant is in the next room. Senator Hennessy. Good morning, Aaron Hennessy from Littleton. I am alone in my office in the state house. Senator Rosenwald. Good morning, Cindy Rosenwald from Nashua. I am home in Nashua, all alone. Okay, and I am Senator Bob Guider from District Two at my home in Warren. My daughter and grandson are upstairs uh, and uh, the dog may occasionally wander through the room. So today, uh, first order of business will be taking up a number of bills that are on the calendar. And <clears throat> we will start with House Bill 154 Local relative to community revitalization tax relief incentives. And I would anticipate that the sponsor of the bill may be present. Representative Conley, you should be all set. Representative Conley, you're rep rec recognized to speak. Good morning and welcome. Thank you, Chairman Guida. Senators uh, confirming all's well. Everyone can hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. Um, yes, I'm Casey Conley, state representative from Dover representing Stratford County District 13, here now to introduce HB 154. Um, this bill would broaden the existing community development incentives under RSA 79E with the goal of promoting new housing construction, particularly new affordable housing construction, uh, both of which are needed desperately in our state. The existing 79E statute, as I suspect the committee knows, um, already let cities and towns offer time limited and targeted property tax incentives for development within a downtown or a town center. The law is enabling legislation, so no city or town is required to use these provisions. 
And any agreement that makes or takes advantage of this statute would require approval from the local governing body. The bill before you has a few pieces intended to further incentivize um, housing in communities that choose to use this, uh, this provision. So first it would let municipalities use these incentives anywhere within the municipal boundary, not just a downtown or a town center. Second, it would extend the maximum term of the incentive to 10 years um, up from the current maximum of nine. And developments would qualify for these uh, expanded incentives, excuse me, incentives, if and only if one third of the new housing units built are reserved for uh, affordable housing. So some context here, um, we know RSA 79E works. The law has been used effectively here in Dover and in countless other communities around the state. Uh, we have a brand new 130 unit apartment building downtown that was built using this program. About seven weeks ago, our city council advanced another 79E project to rehab a, a vacant uh, courthouse right in the center of our city. So it's been used creatively here and in real partnership with private developers. Um, so again, some, some challenges with the law. Um, you know, it's constrained to cities and uh, city and town centers. Uh, which is makes it less likely that affordable housing would be built there. That's where uh, development costs are highest. There's also the highest potential for market rents. Um, so under this bill, municipalities could decide for themselves uh, where they want to use these provisions. So one benefit would potentially be, you know, applying it outside of a downtown where the development cost is lower, which hopefully would translate into lower uh, rental rates. This bill passed the House last term with bipartisan support. Uh, it was in a second committee, uh, Ways and Means, which uh, endorsed it 20 to zero before COVID-19 hit and it ground to a halt. Uh, our legislating ground to a halt. Uh, it's back before. It takes us a little longer. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm getting some feedback and can't Me hear too. the speaker. I'm not sure from where. Hi, am I back or did I, did, I lose, did I lose you guys? No, you're here. Okay, well, I'm, I'm finishing, sorry. Uh, so again, it's, it's uh, enabling legislation. Nobody's required, no city or town required to do anything um, designed to attract new market rate and affordable housing and designed in a way that lets municipalities uh, decide where and under what terms they wish to promote that use. By no means, uh, the be all end all solution to the housing challenges we have in the state, but hopefully uh, a useful tool to address the challenge. With that, happy to take questions. Thank you, Representative. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Uh, Representative, I'm sorry, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one question and that is about the effective date um, just curious, why April 1st of next year? Senator, that's a good question. Um, that was uh, drafted by, I guess in short, um, there's no reason for that and it can be changed at the will of the committee to a more appropriate uh, effective date. Just a quick follow-up if I could. Um, is that just what OLS put in there or? Did... Exactly there. I suspect that, um, and I don't have last year's bill before me. I suspect um, they extended it out by one year. And for what reason uh, the April one was in there, I can't say. It was amended in committee. I don't believe they amended the date, but um, you know, there's no, there's no real reason behind that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Senator Daniels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative, I, I think I heard you say something about 10 years. Yes, sir. The, that's the, the length of the program? Yeah, so you, it, you know, again, these, these are negotiated agreements between the developer and the municipality. And the current law um, has some elevators that sort of, um, if you do this, you can have this many years and so forth. So under the provision contemplated in this bill, um, if you meet the criteria, uh, you would be allowed up to 10 years of this tax incentive. So the 10 year would be the cap. It could not go beyond that. 
follow up? Please. Uh, so if this is an, an enabling legislation, why do we have any kind of a time restriction on it at all? That's a fair question. Something I thought about this morning. Um, I think it's in keeping with the spirit of the existing law, which does have time constraints built into it. But um, I fully, uh, I think I see where you're going with this and I appreciate that perspective. And, and I, I think I agree that if a municipality wants to extend it beyond that and it's supported by the governing body, then by all means, they should be allowed to do so. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, hearing none. Uh, thank you, Representative Conley, for your testimony. Thank you. Ava, how are we doing for follow on witnesses? So we have one other individual signed up to speak on this bill, and that is Ben Frost. Ben, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, committee members. Uh, it's a pleasure to be before you this morning to speak in favor of House Bill 154. Uh, I'm Ben Frost. I'm the uh, Managing Director of Policy and Public Affairs at the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. Um, and I wanna thank Representative Conley for uh, introducing this legislation uh, last year and this year. Um, and we see it as uh, an important uh, enabling legislation to, for municipalities that are interested in promoting uh, affordable housing development in their communities. Um, I was part of the team you now 15 years ago that uh, drafted the original RSA 79E. And I've been really pleased over the years to see how many communities have, uh, been, have used it now. I think uh, at least 59 communities uh, in New Hampshire have adopted the provisions uh, one way or another of RSA 79E. It's, it's pretty flexible legislation uh, that allows municipalities to provide this, uh, this tax incentive to uh, development, rehabilitation in their downtowns. Uh, and then over the years, the legislature has, um, recognizing the, the power and utility of this tool, has, um, has uh, expanded the, the legislation to encompass other sorts of um, uses. And this is yet another one of those. Um, the, the ability to use RSA 79E for affordable housing development anywhere in a community uh, would be a really welcome um, uh, change to the law. Uh, as you know, you know we, we have a, um, you know, lots of people call it a crisis of uh, housing affordability in New Hampshire, and it is a crisis of supply. Uh, we're simply not building enough housing throughout the state uh, to meet the demand that already exists. Um, you know, by one estimate, there's a, a shortage of something on the order of 20,000 uh, uh, units of housing for purchase, for rent uh, throughout the state, just to meet the current demand to restore some sort of balance to the, the housing market. Uh, and beyond that, we'd be looking to additional housing to accommodate uh, growth uh, of our economy. Um, this, this bill is really in two parts. Uh, so the, the first part is the establishment of the housing opportunity zone in sections one and two of the legislation. Uh, sections three and four uh, deal with the affordable housing fund. Uh, and this was a, uh, an amendment uh, last year that uh, we asked uh, Representative Conley to entertain and he graciously agreed to do that. Um, and uh, this, this um, sections three and four would change the uh, income targeting that is associated with the state's affordable housing trust fund. Um, the affordable housing fund was established in 1988 by the legislature. Uh, it is the state's uh, housing trust fund, if you will, uh, and it is administered on behalf of the state by New Hampshire Housing for the purpose of uh, funding the development of low income affordable rental housing in particular. Uh, there are other purposes for which it's available too, uh, such as working with cooperative manufactured housing parks. Um, and over the years, the legislature may, has made appropriations to the affordable housing fund now totaling uh, about $23 million, uh, which is uh, almost totally out in projects right now. Uh, so it is in use uh, in various projects throughout the state. We've uh, financed uh, I think 85 projects with over 2000 housing units um, all over the state using the affordable housing fund. It's really uh, gap filler finance. Uh, so 
uh, where a developer presents to us an application that might utilize the uh, low income housing tax credit, which is a federal uh, program uh, through the US Department of Treasury, and we administer that on behalf of Treasury. Um, you know, there might be a gap in the financing and the affordable housing fund uh, is one of those really important gap fillers. It is in fact, the most flexible source of financing uh, uh, capital that we uh, at New Hampshire housing have available to us. So we're grateful to the legislature for one creating it many years ago and for making appropriations to it so that we can use it uh, to its effect. Um, now recognizing that the affordable housing fund was uh, created in 1988, that was a, uh, a different, uh, a simpler time, if you will, uh, and the income targeting associated with that statute doesn't really fit the uh, programs that uh, we have available to us now. So sections three and four of the legislation uh, of House Bill 154 um, retarget, uh, establish new uh, income targeting that comport with uh, the federal uh, financing programs that we use. So um, having consistent income targeting from one financing source to another, because recognizing that many sources of financing are, are often used in these projects, having consistency among them would make uh, administration from our end uh, as we finance the projects and compliance from the developer's end uh, a, a bit simpler. And, um, and that's what we're proposing here. Um, uh, Representative Conley uh, mentioned the, um, the, or actually uh, Senator Rosenwald, you asked the question about the, the effective date. Uh, I believe, and I, I, this was an OLS drafting, but I believe that that is because April 1st is the beginning of the municipal taxation year. That is, that's when new uh, property assessments take effect. Uh, and so to the extent any um, uh, municipal uh, governing body is uh, looking to certain tax revenues, they'd be counting on uh, certain uh, tax incentives going to uh, particular developments as of the beginning of that new tax year. So uh, April 1st, 2022 does seem to make sense to me. Uh, and I think that that was probably the logic uh, that OLS used in employing that. Uh, and uh, Senator Daniels, you asked about the uh, the, the time period and, and Representative Conley is, is uh, correct. Uh, the, the existing structure of RSA 79E provides for periods of uh, tax relief up to a certain term. So the base term uh, for other in other portions of the existing statute is up to five years and then up to additional periods of, afford, of, of uh, tax relief uh, for different uh, types of development such as historic preservation or the creation of housing uh, or um, oh, there are some others too and I can't remember them offhand but they, they're always it always enables municipalities to provide this tax relief up to a, a particular period of time and that is a matter of negotiation between the property owner and the uh, uh, local governing body uh, which administers this on behalf of every municipality. Um, that's, I think, all I have to say, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Um, back to harp on the effective date. If we wouldn't have, if it weren't effective until April, that would mean that it couldn't even go before a governing body before then. I mean, I understand why the programs would start with the municipal tax year, but surely there is work to do before the tax assessment relief and the other financing uh, would move forward. So I guess I still question if that's the right effective date. Well, Senator Rosenwald, I, I, I agree with you. Um, <laughs> I, um, in my, my response uh, was really an explanation of what I th think the logic was of OLS. Uh, but yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, a, a, a local legislative body would not be able to act on this until after that effective date or as of that effective date. So that means okay. for towns that operate under you know, a March town meeting form of government, you'd be looking at March uh, 2023 before right. they'd be able to do this in the absence of a special town meeting, which they'd be unlikely to do for this purpose. It's not an emergency. Um, the, 
and, and that's that's for sections one and two of the bill. Sections three and four, the affordable housing fund income targeting, uh, that it, that could go into effect today and we could utilize it at New Hampshire Housing today. Uh, there's no uh, need to associate that with the municipal taxation year. Um, so if, if you were to change the effective date, you could certainly move it up and we'd appreciate, uh, I'd say the sooner the better. Thank you. Senator Daniels. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> ben, the money that comes out of the affordable housing fund, that, that, that goes out as a loan, is that correct? Yes, Senator, it does go out as a loan. Uh, these are uh, um, non-amortizing loans, uh, non-interest bearing. So they, they live with the project until something happens. So uh, the period of affordability runs out, the loan would get repaid. The property is sold, the loan would get repaid. Uh, the property is refinanced, which is the most common uh, sort of thing. Uh, the loan gets repaid. Uh, so that comes back to New Hampshire Housing for recirculation into other projects. Okay, follow up. Follow up. If uh, and, and you mentioned that the program has been in effect since 1988. So with, with all the money circulating back in, uh, at what point in time does the fund become self-sufficient? Well, that's an excellent question, Senator Daniels. Um, I, I I don't think I have a a really precise answer for that, but uh, I think you just, you'd need to recognize that um, there is an extraordinary need for housing development in the state. Uh, and um, there is a need for capital for in particular uh, development for that's affordable for people of lower incomes. Um, so we, we get, it, it depends upon the year and the, the circumstances of each individual project, but we might get a you know, million dollars coming back into the fund on an annual basis. And that might be um, helpful in one or two projects. Um, it it doesn't, doesn't really go that far. As useful as it is, uh, there's still um, not a, a great deal of money available uh, to us to deploy into developments. Okay, and one final follow-up, please. Um, when you get to the uh, parts, uh, it's four, three and four, I guess, where they talk about the, uh, the income levels. Yes. It talks about the, the gross, uh, gross amount of, of income from a family. Where you have children that are currently moving in and out of parents' homes or whatever, how do you determine uh, whether something is going to be on a permanent basis to know whether to include somebody's income in that or not. Well, you would, you would look at, um, and that's a, a really good question, especially under the, the circumstances we're facing right now. You, you would look at the uh, family income at the time they are applying for occupancy of a, a, of a unit. And that would be done on an ongoing basis. Uh, so, uh, for example, you might have a, uh, a mixed income development, say it's, it's 50 units and you know, half of them are market rate and half of them are affordable. Uh, at some point, you might find that one of the families that initially occupied uh, one of the affordable units and were, they were you know, income qualified, uh, you might find that their income was over uh, the, uh, the qualifying limit. So, uh, in, in that case, we would employ what's known as a, a next available unit uh, rule. And this is associated with a lot of the projects we finance. So those people would continue to live in that unit, but it in, in essence, from a bookkeeping standpoint would be converted to a recognized market rate unit. And the next market rate unit that's available would, be, would essentially turn into a, an affordable unit. So you do count the income and you do look at it uh, from a, a qualifying standpoint from year to year, uh, but there are tools to address income changes in families. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I have uh, one, one more follow just to Please. go a little bit deeper on this? If, <clears throat> if someone were approved for uh, and qualified for the low income housing, um, but then a family, a family member or two moved in with them at the next check, does that throw them off the list? 
No, no, it doesn't. It, it's done only on an annual basis. Okay, so a year from then, they've got two, two of their children living with them, but, but their income now no longer qualifies them for the low income. How, how does that work? Right. Well, so in, in that case, you would, um, you, you'd, they would continue to occupy the unit. It would be converted essentially to a market rate unit and the next available unit uh, on the market rate side would be, uh, in essence, for, as I said, from a bookkeeping standpoint, converted to affordability. Okay. Thank you. Further questions from the committee? Mr. Chair, Senator Hennessy and Senator D'Alessandro have their hand raised. Oh, yes, you do. Thank you. Senator Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Eva. Uh, ben, I have a question on the, um, the tax relief incentives. Is that just from the municipal tax side of things? Is that the only tax affected? Um, yes, tax Senator. It, it does not apply to, and there's a, it's a different statute, not in this, this legislation, but it does not apply to the, um, the state education property tax. Follow up, please. Does it does, so? It doesn't apply to the county either. Oh, it does apply to the county tax and to the uh, local education tax as well. Follow up. Go ahead, please. So, just um, from one of the first questions that Senator Daniels asked, I'm wondering if you know, um, just historically, if that's why the ten-year or the five-year cap was initially put in. Uh, that, that's a really great question, and it was 15 years ago. Um, so um, I'm trying to remember whether this was, um, I think it may actually have been part of the original draft uh, of legislation uh, for RSA 79E. Um, and it was a recognition that uh, there are a lot of people who are concerned about um, municipal tax revenue, and they don't want to offer unlimited uh, tax uh, relief in, in, in any situation uh, that is uh, so for with the, for example with exemptions you you have to regularly reapply for for thing, for things here uh, it's it's a negotiation between a property owner and uh, the local governing body uh, for how much they they're able to get and how much based maybe on how much they need to in their pro forma for development um, so I, I think it was just a a uh, recognition of the some the conservative uh, view of municipal revenue and not wanting to give too much away. Senator <laughs> Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ben, for, for coming. Appreciate your testimony. Section three and section four have been changed uh, fairly significantly. Persons of low income has been redefined. Person of moderate income has been redefined. And then you've added another category, persons of very low income. And then you've changed the, uh, the, the ability of the authority to provide assistance. What's, what's, what was the rationale uh, behind those, those changes, particularly adding the persons of, of very low income? Thank you, Senator. Uh, it, this is really done to be consistent with uh, other federal sources of uh, project financing, in particular uh, tax exempt bonds, uh, which have, if you look at section four, yeah. uh, th that, that unit count, uh, the 50%, 50%, 40%, 20%, that right. is straight out of federal uh, tax law. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and, and the addition of uh, and this is on page two, lines 11 through 14 in yeah. section three, um, that also is out of federal tax law. So we wanted to make sure that the Affordable Housing Fund was consistent with that uh, to make it easier to uh, finance and underwrite the projects. So basically it's a compliance issue. Well, it, it, it is to an extent, I mean, this is not uh, legally necessary Okay. It is very convenient. Uh, this change would be very convenient for us because it make, just makes it easier to do the accounting on projects. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions? Uh, I have a question, uh, Ben, not necessarily related to uh, low, moderate, or very low income, but are there any such tax benefits looking forward for 
elderly assisted living facilities. Given that a huge population you know, boom is coming of retirees and we are aging pretty quickly. Yes, uh, Chairman Guida, there, there is a provision in the law and I, I don't have it uh, off the top of my head uh, that, that deals with the taxation of uh, elderly congregate care facilities. Um, and and I, it's not something I'm really familiar with. I simply know that it does exist. I don't know how many properties use it, um, uh, but I could you know, poke around and see if I could find more information just, on that. Just, that's fine, Ben. Just knowing that it's there, I can go find it. Um, any further questions? Hearing none. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Yeah. Any further testimony, Ava? Mr. Chair, there is no one else who signed up to speak. So this would be the appropriate time for anyone under the attendees to virtually raise their hand or dial star nine if they're calling in via phone. And I do not see any hands, Mr. Chair. All right, then at this time, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on House Bill 154. And we'll move on to House Bill 330. All right, then I would uh, recognize the prime sponsor. So Mr. Chair, Representative Lang is the prime sponsor. I do not see him under the attendees. However, the next individual signed up to speak is Representative Abrami and he is here. All right. So I don't know if Representative Abrami is able or willing to introduce the bill, but. Right, yeah, he's not a sponsor, but I'm happy to, I'm sure he's knowledgeable. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm glad I signed in late last night uh, as the backup, not knowing if Representative Lang uh, would be there. I was I was signed up more for the committee. Uh, are, are there any other sponsors that, that are on, on call now? I mean, I'm um, not introducing the bill. I'll, I'll introduce the bill. And I just want to uh, make sure. Pat, it's, it's hard to hear you. I don't know, if, can you? Yeah, you I know. move closer to the mic or, or perhaps yeah, I'm gonna get, I'll get as close as I can here. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Chair, I'm here to uh, introduce House Bill uh, 330. Uh, this bill, uh, uh, first off, uh, State Rep. Pat Abrami, uh, Rocky M19. Uh, I'm here to introduce uh, House Bill 330. Uh, this bill makes a, a simple change. When it came to ways and means, there were two changes and one that we amended out. Uh, the first change was uh, to increase the number of brick and mortar locations in which sports betting can occur. Uh, I guess they're officially called sports book retail uh, locations. Uh, <clears throat> we thought it was just too premature to start expanding from the two, uh, from the 10 to unlimited number of locations, uh, especially given that only two locations in the past year exist and that, that is uh, Manchester and, and Seabrook. So the other thing the bill does that we, we passed 24 to nothing out of ways and means, and it was on consent calendar was to, um, was to, it, it, there's a difference between uh, what can be bet on with the, uh, those betting online with the app versus the brick and mortar. And that is uh, something called a tier two bet and let me give you an example of a tier two bet. So the game is going on, let's say it's a football game and you're in the middle of the uh, first quarter and you wanna bet on who's gonna, which team is gonna score most points in the second quarter. Uh, right now, if you had an app, you can place that bet on your phone, but you cannot place that bet if you were in Manchester or in Seabrook at the physical locations. Uh, we heard a lot of a lot of concern from the the physical locations that they have people sitting in their seat seats in their locations who are betting on on physically their betting uh, who want to do that and they're not able they have to go to their phone I guess they can they go to their phone 
and do it. Uh, but they're, they're, they're betting and, and these locations get no revenue for that. So we thought it a matter of fairness uh, between the, the you know, those using the apps and the physical locations that this, this made some sense. And as I said, we, we passed the 24 nothing out of, my, out of uh, Ways and Means to do so. And that's my testimony. All right, any questions from members of the committee? Senator Daniels. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative. Um, could you speak a moment to the constitutionality of the state limiting uh, sports book retail locations to 10 locations? Are we picking winners and losers? Uh, some, would, some would claim that, uh, but I, I think we have other things in the state that we limit. Uh, you know, when we, when we had our casino bills for years, uh, <laughs> Senator D'Alessandro could attest to this, that debate roared on, but we still had bills, uh, even in the Senate that passed, that limited the number. Uh, I guess that would need to be challenged in the courts. Uh, but we just thought it was too premature. We weren't necessarily against it. You know, when you pass a bill, uh, as we did, we, we passed sports betting with, with just the 10 locations. And it didn't look like, you know, they, they were rushing to the doors to, uh, to, to, uh, to jump on board. And we have ten, two locations so far. We thought, let, let's let some time pass by before we consider expanding the locations on the House side. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? All right, uh, uh, Representative, could you explain the, 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 the tiers system? Uh, uh, hopefully somebody on lottery is, is on All the right. call. Uh, I, I don't think I do it justice. All uh, right. I'm not quite sure the difference between two and three. Uh, all all we, we heard testimony on was, was, was two was missing and um, I was, yes, uh, if someone from lottery is on it, I'm sure they can answer that question. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Ava? So, Mr. Chair, I don't know. There is someone from the Lottery Commission on. Uh, Charles McIntyre is on. He does not have his hand raised. Representative Almy, however, does have her hand raised. All right. We'll go to Representative Almy, and then if we could inquire as to whether uh, Mr. McIntyre is willing to testify, it'd be helpful. And Commissioner McIntyre does now have his hand raised, so. Excellent. All right, Representative Almy, welcome. Yes, well, I was just going to add something to the number of locations on, I also on only understand tier two as, as being something that is allowed on the cell phones on under sports betting all over the state, but the, the Brook and the one in Manchester, is it, are on upset that people have to sit in their chairs and eat their food and, uh, and can't use this part of the betting mechanism without circumventing their profit margin. So uh, that's a problem with the tiers. But the, the reason that we wanted to keep it limited to 10 at the moment was on uh, that the lottery told us that um, they can't see that they're going to be able to get to 10 for quite a long time. And there was a feeling that the market would be more difficult for new openings until there was a, a demonstrated demand beyond these two places. And that if anybody could set up and two people might be trying to set up in the same community and both of them would look at the other and decide this isn't worth doing because we're splitting a small market. So that's, that's why we, we just left it at 10 to see how it develops. Uh, we did have assurance from the lottery that this was gonna take a long time. So hey, thank that you. change it at a later time, thanks. 
All right, any questions from members of the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much, Representative Omni. Okay, Mr. Chair, we have Commissioner McIntyre. Charlie, welcome aboard. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Good morning, sir. Good morning, yes, we can. Uh, th thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Charlie McIntyre from the New Hampshire Lottery, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm here to uh, offer our support for this uh, change to the law. Um, this was an oversight in, on our part. Uh, we did not think tier two wagering, which is wagering which starts, which is after the event has already begun. So as Representative Bromley testified, if you bet on a football game, um, that game starts, you can no longer place bets on any part of that game. Whereas now you can bet, we would like to be able to have the facilities take bets on second half scores, what the fourth quarter will look like, whether the over under will change, that kind of stuff. So um, we're in favor of it and happy to answer any questions you have, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you. Senator Daniels. Thank you. Charlie, could you exp explain tier one and tier three? Sure. Um, tier one is essentially prior to the event going off, placing a bet. So the Super Bowl, before the Super Bowl goes off, um, you bet on the Buccaneers, which everyone in this, everyone in this state did, and you win or lose because the game happened. Tier two is bets that are taken while the event is taking place. So the first half of the game is going off. You want to take a bet on the second half, or you want to take a bet on the fourth quarter, or... Tom Brady may throw a three touchdown pass in the second half. That's a tier two bet. And a tier three is a residual one, which is neither tier one nor tier two, but it's essentially used for parlay wagering, which is you want to take a bet on multiple events, kind of like a lottery ticket. You want to bet on the Buccaneers winning the Super Bowl, the Rangers winning the Stanley Cup, and the Red Sox winning the World Series. Um, that would be a parlay bet, but really a tier three. So that's the three types of bets we would, we would take. Thank you. Follow up? Yes, sir. And do I recall correctly that with, with sports wagering that a community must accept that? It does, sir. Yes. It has to be an affirmative vote by the, uh, by the city or town. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? All right. If not, I have, I have a question, Charlie. Um, do you have any sense of increased revenues possibly from tier two expansion? It will increase revenues, but not materially. Um, I will tell you that our expectations of revenue from sports betting were low, um, and we're exceeding revenues significantly on sports betting that we never ex anticipated, um, far more than we expected. And a lot of that's coming from out of state, which is you know nice. Okay, follow up for myself. Um, in that a person can use their cell phone to place wagers in sports betting. Is that kind of make the 10 establishment limit um, inapplicable or unenforceable? Um, it's a good question. It's a good way to look at it, Mr. Chairman. Um, what we have found is the player who uses the app and the mobile is very different than the customer who uses the physical sports book. And what I mean by that is the majority of wagering that's done in physical locations is done at $1,000 or more per bet. So these are people who are betting a significant amount of money. Uh, and the majority of those are from out of state. And so on a mobile phone, the, that skews older, believe it, as you can imagine. These are folks who are, are very wealthy and have means. Um, the mobile app and the internet, most of the wagering is much, much lower. It's $10, $20 per game per bet. And it skews much, much younger. And so it's a different kind of customer, if, if that makes sense. Some folks just like to be in the physical location and watch the event live. Uh, with other folks who were also um, betting. And there's an energy to it that you have to feel to understand. 
Um, it's like, if you, if you know horse racing, watching a horse race live has an energy to it that is special versus watching it on your TV, you know, same idea. Okay. But really, if you look at it, we, we sort of view the, the, the placement of physical sports books because in New Hampshire, we actually own the rights to sports betting. This isn't a licensed um, function. This is a state owned function, like similar to liquor. So we place the locations like as if liquor places their locations for maximum revenue for the state. Uh, and that's the model the, the state adopted. Hmm. So could a person who wants to place a $1,000 bet do so on the phone? Yes, but it's not as likely. It, it's okay. very, it just doesn't happen as much. Folks feel with that level of money, folks feel better doing it in person, ironically. Um, there's not the level, same level of interaction. I, I don't know how to explain it other than it's just one of those things we've learned along the process. It's an entirely different customer. Okay. Now, uh, do you think keeping this 10 person limit, uh, 10 uh, facility limit is, um, is appropriate and, and um, you know, worth doing? I mean, certainly we were never opposed. It was, it was a, I don't want to say arbitrary, but it was a limit set by ways and means at the time the bill was passed. I think it was subject to a compromise as often these things are. Um, we, we wrote the law, we wrote the law with no limit to it. And we could foresee a time when that we would run up against that. Similar to like banks, when banks first opened, it was a branch and you walked in and, and the rest. And now they're ATM machines. And so it's the potential for us to run up against that if the technology would allow, it is possible, but I don't see it happening in the next year or so, if that's the question, Mr. Chairman. In the long term, Actually, yes, short term, no. So how many of the 10, I may miss this, uh, how many of the 10 licenses for facilities are out there now? Or how many so facilities- So there are two are now? Yeah. So, so the question, there are two facilities up and running now. I would suggest to you COVID got in the way pretty good of us opening other ones. Um, and we're not right now in the process, various phases of three more. So we're nowhere near the 10, 10 facility limit then? No, no, we're nowhere near, not near 10, no. No, I mean, certainly, right, like I said, okay. All right, thank you very much. Any further questions from members of the committee? Senator Rosenwald. You're muted. Sorry, I couldn't you find go. my there mute button. Thank <laughs> you, Mr. Chairman. Charlie, um, do you have any sense that the two in the two places where there is retail, that there's cannibalization of other games or other revenues within the facilities, or is this just additional incremental revenues? Actually, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, what we have discovered is actually it increases the, the other revenue streams. The hospitality in the two locations has increased what I'm told double digits um, because of sports betting. So there are more mm -hmm. folks in the place who are ordering food and beverages while they're there. So it's been additive. Okay, thank you. Further questions from members of the committee? Hearing none. Thank you, Charlie. Good to hear from you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You as well. Ava? Okay, Mr. Chair. Next, we have Rick Newman. Okay. Rick, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, I, I'm Rick Newman, representing the New Hampshire Charitable Gaming Operators Association. And um, we're, we support this bill. Uh, everything that I would have said, Charlie covered, or Representative Rami covered. So, uh, if there are any questions, happy to answer them. But uh, other than that, I can end my testimony. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions from the members of the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much. Mr. Chair, so the last person we had signed up to speak was the prime sponsor, which is Representative Lang. He's still not here. Um, 
So I have no one else signed up to speak. And if anyone else would like to testify on this bill, this would be the appropriate time to raise your hand virtually or dial star nine if you're calling via the phone. And I do not see any hands, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll close the hearing on uh, House Bill 330. And we will move on to House Bill 533, establishing a division of investigation and compliance in the Lottery Commission. And would recognize the prime sponsor. Representative Abrami, you should be all set. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, State Rep. Pat Abrami, Rockingham 19 Stratum. Uh, I'm here to introduce House Bill 533, establishing a division of investigation and compliance in the Lottery Commission. This bill came out uh, in the House Ways and Means 22 to nothing and was on the consent calendar. Uh, I filed this bill uh, at the request of Charlie McIntyre, Executive Director of Lottery. Uh, there are three things that the, that the bill does. It formally creates a division of investigation and compliance within the Lottery Commission. The bill creates a structure only to be staffed by existing staff. The bill did not, and does that did not ask for additional staff or for title changes at all. In doing so, it clearly outlines the duties of investigation and compliance. Again, much of which is is going on today. <clears throat> it changes. <clears throat> the second thing it does, it changes the way in which lottery interacts with the AG's office when it comes to background checks required for licenses. In short, lottery will do a lot of the data gathering as it, walks, as it works with the AG, but the AG's office still uh, has the final say on the fitness of an applicant to receive a license. What it in effect does is it speeds up the licensing process since fact uh, by doing the fact finding uh, within lottery since it's a priority for them, it may not be a priority for the AG's office. And the third thing the bill does is it, it uh, gives the uh, Division of Investigation and uh, Enforcement rulemaking authority. <clears throat> so uh, what, what House Ways and Means saw was the lottery, was a lottery that has uh, grown significantly with Kino, sports betting, and a significant growth in charitable gaming, especially now that both bodies have passed the historic racing bill. The functions of, the, of investigation and compliance have always been extremely important. We concluded that an organizational structure that reflects this is very much needed. Uh, and that's uh, in effect my, my, my uh, presentation. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I will take questions, but it uh, looks like Charlie McIntyre is on the line and he could probably answer your questions more completely than, than I, I can. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thanks very much, Pat. Okay, so next we have Mr. Chairs Rick Newman. Okay. Is, is uh, Director McIntyre available too? Let's see here. Um, we got a couple hands. So yes, Commissioner McIntyre is available. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and hear from him first since he was the, he, his department requ he requested the legislation. Mr. Chairman, if I could, this is Charlie McIntyre. Uh, on the line as well as our Chief Compliance Officer who would be in charge of this division. I thought it'd be helpful for him to testify as well on this matter. Sure, go ahead. And uh, John Conforti. Mr. Chair, I just brought in Mr. Conforti. Thank you. Mr. Conforti, you're recognized. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for um, um, uh, recognizing me. Um, as Representative Brahmi said, um, we did request um, the, this um, legislation. Um, and really, as Representative Brahmi said, um, mostly this is a restructuring of uh, the existing investigation and enforcement division that we have in place. Um, but most importantly, uh, what it does is uh, 
it changes the relationship with regard to licensing of new applicants for um, racing or charitable gaming licenses. Um, the process that as it goes right now is we receive the license um, and the attorney general's office has the sole investigation and decision-making function with regard to suitability of a licensee. Um, and as Representative Abrami said, obviously the Attorney General's office is very busy. Uh, gaming matters are not necessarily their highest priority. Um, and what we found is, um, although we are you know, very help, hope, um, appreciative of our partnership with DOJ, um, we get squeezed in where we can and we understand that. Um, so we uh, wanted to be able to take some of the um, uh, legwork in investigation off of DOJ's plate. Um, and so this law would allow us to gather that information, um, do some preliminary fact finding with regard to suitability of licensees and send it over to the attorney general's office. Um, and again, as Representative Abrami said, the final decision making would remain with DOJ, um, but we do think this would make for an easier process uh, as it would allow us to do um, some of the, um, the key fact finding um, and then present that to DOJ. Um, it also uh, provides for rulemaking um, and for the potential for enhanced penalties. As Representative Abrami said, there are um, charitable gaming has grown uh, substantially with the prospect of uh, additional growth. Um, and there is a potential concern that the growth would outstrip the existing fine structure that we have um, in the law right now. Um, so this law would allow us um, to go to uh, superior court to get enhanced penalties where appropriate. Um, and, and really all we want to make sure is that as uh, charitable gaming grows, that we have uh, enough tools in our bag to deter bad behavior or to, um, to, to address that if it, uh, if it does come, uh, if it does come up. Um, so that's the, the key elements of this legislation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, questions from the committee, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Conforti. So section one says that this new division applies to both racing and charitable gaming or RSAs 284 and 287. But then all the rest of the bill seems to only apply to racing and not to, to 287. So wondering if you, is it not necessary because 287 already includes this new relationship and do, civil penalty enhancement, or do we need to make a change? So Senator Roosevelt, thank you for the question. Um, I think the, the the provenance of this was uh, was that this was initially a part of the historic course racing bill, um, and um, it certainly the um, emphasis on uh, increasing uh, the powers of the division relate more specifically to um, historic course racing as opposed to um, as as opposed to two eighty seven D games. So in terms of the um, uh, some of the, the primary powers, the ability to gather intelligence and data um, that will be helpful on both the 287D and 284 sides. Um, however, our primary um, aim with this bill was to address the upcoming licenses that will come um, with historic course racing, which are by, by the nature of the bill that has passed the House and the Senate. Um, those are licenses that occur under RSA 284. Um, so while we would welcome um, to have, I think, identical language on both sides, on Games of Chance and on the racing side, uh, our, primary, our primary aim at this point in time is to make sure that we're prepared for um, the increase in licenses under RSA 284. Further follow questions? Up. Yeah, Please. follow up if I could. So then why why set up the division to handle both 284 and 287 if it's necessary to increase the scope of 287's I mean investigation I've had applicants we could add but 
enhanced penalties. I mean, charitable gaming has grown as well. It, it, it has, Senator. And again, I, I wouldn't have any objection to that being to it being applied equally to both. I think, at, again, it was initially provided as a, a an element of the historic horse racing bill. I will say, Senator, that the facilities where historic horse racing is going to take place, at least initially, um, will all be GOE facilities under 287 as well. So there is um, the investigation and enforcement arm is going to be looking at those facilities holistically, both with regard to games of chance and with regard to racing. Um, if that bill is, is eventually passed and signed by the governor. I'm a little more confused now. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> What's so, so... GOE? That, um... <laughs> I'm sorry. I should I, I I should not talk in code. So the the facilities will both be operating games of chance under RC 287D, and potentially historic horse racing, which is governed by the licensing structure of RC 284. Um, so although you're talking about two different types of gaming, those would exist within the same facility, and certainly the investigation and enforcement would be focused on the facility at large, both the, both the games of chance games and, and any racing activities that were happening there as well. I hope I clarified that. Okay. Further questions? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Hennessy has her hand raised. Oh, I keep missing those hands. I'm sorry, Aaron. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Thank you. And thank you, John, for taking my question. I, um, I'm confused about how, and I'm, and I'm not offering to give you more people, but I'm confused about how you'll be able to do this in half the amount of time going from, I think it says 90 days to 45 days um, with no additional people and taking on more work that the AG's office was initially doing. Sure, thank you for the question, Senator. We, um, we do have um, some uh, positions that were included in the sports betting bill that we are in the process of looking at filling. So there will be uh, some additions to the team that were already within our budget. Um, and uh, at, at present time, I think we are in need really, again, we'll address the manpower issues with regard, I think, to positions that are already available. Um, the biggest need, which I think this will address, is the ability to um, get some of the investigative software um, and have the ability to make contact and gather intelligence from um, um, other law enforcement agencies or other agencies. At present, we have no authority under the existing uh, either RSA 284 or 287D um, to do that type of investigation. So um, there will be an increase in manpower, um, but really... Um, what we're most lacking right now is the authority to gather that information, um, which really is, is only sits with um, the attorney general's office right now. Thank you. Further questions? John, can you give me an idea how many uh, investigations, slant prosecutions there have been, if any, um, in the racing venue? Well, investigations are ongoing, Senator. Um, we, um, we visit all of our um, facilities, be it racing or uh, with games of chance on a rotating basis. Um, the larger facilities get visited, uh, I think approximately once a week. Um, at present, Senator, we only have one um, facility that is a, uh, a racing venue, uh, that is Seabrook. Um, and uh, since we've had the change in ownership in Seabrook, um, which was, I believe, two years ago, um, we have not had any administrative hearings with regard to them. Um, we do have administrative actions with regard to games of chance. Um, we have probably a handful um, uh, in any given year, ranging from licensing issues to uh, more severe um, uh, violations of uh, the statute or regulations. Okay. Uh, does the attorney general, when they're doing an investigation, do they inform you of what they're doing? 
Yeah. So just to be clear, Senator, the investigations that we're talking about are with respect to um, applications and suitability to be associated with gaming uh, on the front end before a license is issued. Um, and yes, so the way the process plays out right now, um, we provide the, applica the application and some background information um, to the Attorney General's office. They come back with a, a determination. Um, sometimes if it's a close case, they will consult with us about information that they have learned over the course of the review or investigation. Um, but generally that takes place mostly with the attorney general's office. Um, and with regard to racing licenses, um, I believe the attorney general's office mostly outsources that to um, a CPA firm or investigation firm. Hmm. Um, you say that you utilize the rules process for changing fines and penalties. Uh, is there a particular reason? I, I, I am not necessarily a fan of using 541A for such things as we're talking significant amounts of money and, and significant potentially uh, uh, possibly uh, incarceration and so forth. So uh, would you be opposed to considering legislation to set that schedule of fines and penalties? Senator, yes, I, I, I may have misspoke, so I want to make sure I'm clear. The fines are set by statute. There are guidelines in terms of what uh, constitutes what level of offense within regulations. Um, but those, uh, in terms of what the fine structure is, um, that is set specifically in statute. Um, and again, with regard to what um, House Bill 533 does, um, is it allows for enhanced penalties in instances where the existing fine structure is, is deemed insufficient. And that would require the Lottery Commission to go to the Superior Court to address that specifically. So um, anyone who, has, um, who, who is the subject of those fines would have due process rights within, um, uh, within that, that, that court case. I do also want to just make sure I'm, I'm very clear. We do not have any law enforcement um, uh, abilities here at the commission. So anything that we're talking about is civil in nature. It would be a civil fines or, or uh, actions against licenses. Right. I, I would refer to Romans 7, where it says the lottery commission shall adopt rules under 541A relative to the administration, the investigation and enforcement division, including processes for investigation and a schedule of fines and penalties. Oh, I apologize, Senator. You're, you're right. Um, because then that would, I would not have any objection to um, removing that from um, rulemaking and putting that specifically in the statute. All right. Just for consider. Thank you. Any further questions? <clears throat> All right. Um, Thank you very much, John. And uh, Charlie, is there anything you need to add? No, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you both. Ava, who's up next? We are Rick? back to, yeah, we're back to Rick Newman. Okay. Rick, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Rick Newman representing the New Hampshire Charitable Gaming Operators Association. We are here in support of this bill. We believe that the Lottery Commission uh, giving them the uh, tools they need to ensure integrity and uh, investigations that are necessary in the, the gaming world in New Hampshire is vital. We believe the most important part of gaming is uh, having the public uh, understand and be confident that games are being run fairly and integrity is, is the most important thing. I think I think uh, the lottery does that now, and I think this enhances their ability to do it. And that concludes my testimony. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Um, Rick, would you then have any objection to including 287 in the um, entirety of the bill and not just setting up the enforcement division, but actually um, giving 
the lottery commission the ability to look into the applicants and speed up the process for charitable gaming. Yeah, none, none whatsoever. Thank you. Rick, how many, uh, I mean, do you investigate these charitable gaming facilities annually with every renewal or um, is it based upon suspicion or, or, you know, concern regarding perhaps misconduct? You ask me what the lottery does? Yes. So um, obviously in the beginning, they, they, there's a dive, down, a deep dive and looking at applicants. Um, every year the licenses are renewed, I think, and every year new background checks, new fingerprints and such are taken. Um, there is, I'm aware of an ongoing process where um, the commission reaches out to game operator employers on a regular basis, seeking uh, to update information that's in the files and investigate uh, you know, all of the people who own a piece of these facilities. Um, so that certainly is an ongoing process. Okay. That, that just continues, it's always, I, I know that uh, they're very thorough, I can tell you that. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing no hands and hearing none. Thank you, Rick. All right, was, we got a couple things going on. So Representative Brahmi and um, John had, Conforti has their hand raised. Um, I don't know. No, let's go with Representative Brahmi. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, there, there, there was a little confusion because we did extract this bill, uh, this portion of the historic racing bill out to make it a separate bill. And uh, I'll, I can't speak for the whole committee, but I would have no problem making sure uh, 287 is, is included as well. Uh, understand that for the first three years, uh, histor the historic racing. Uh, you all you need is a is a uh, is a charitable gaming license, which is under 287. But in three years from now, anyone who has historic racing will also need a license under 284. As and I don't want to get into the historic racing bill, but that's the way the the, the language does read. So uh, again, I'm just saying I, I have I have no problem uh, with with that. Uh, Broaden, broadening this out right away to include all these new provisions under both 287 and, and 284. And remember, <clears throat> historic racing can only, because you're going to continue to need, no matter what, you're going to continue to need a charitable gaming license to run it. So this will always just be in under in, in, within charitable gaming locations. Uh, and since, since if you do amend, uh, when uh, when Senator uh, Hennessy was speaking, I, I, I went to that section and I noticed on the second page of the bill on line seven, uh, within 45, uh, the drafters left the word days out. So, <laughs> right. okay. So um, I, I just leave you with that. Thank you. Pat, do you have any thoughts on um... Uh, making fines and penalties statutory rather than rules. I don't have an opinion either way, to be honest with you on that. Um, um, you know, it seems the way the way we're doing it seems to be okay. Uh, we, we didn't address that in ways and means in the house. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? All right, and now we have uh, John Conforti back, correct? Yep, he did lower his hand, but I'll bring him in. Thank you, Senator Guy. I just I wanted to just um, answer the question that you had asked, Mr. Newman, in terms of the investigations. Um, there is an initial investigation when we receive an application, and then by law, um, applicants are reviewed again every five years. Um, so that is the, the that is the the suitability determinations. Um, they occur at, at at their first application, and then um, every five years thereafter. Um, and then, obviously, in the interim, 
we do audits and investigation reviews. We do uh, visits um, and we've audited every room. Um, obviously, if we saw something in, um, in either our audit or our, um, our periodic um, reviews that uh, caused the concern, we might reopen that earlier. Uh, but that's the general, um, the general cadence of those investigations is um, upon receipt of application and every five years thereafter. Have any sense how many how many current operators <laughs> that we have? Sixteen. Okay. All right. Thanks, John. Appreciate your help, Mr. Thank Sheriff. you. Okay. Before he goes. Oh, was there? Oh, I'm sorry, Senator D. I I missed that hand again. Oh, thank you. Thank thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to John, just before he leaves, <clears throat> John. How many charities are participating in charitable gaming at this point in time? Senator Delsandra, I, I don't have that number off of the top of my head. It is, I believe, uh, well over 200. Um, I can get that number for you, though. Um, I can get my licensing person to run the, the most current numbers on okay. that. Right. Further question, Mr. Chairman? For John? Please. And John, of these two hundred, these two hundred, how many sites are, are are being taken advantage of by charitable gaming? Um, for uh, games of chance uh, alone, not not putting bingo as a separate item. For games of chance, um, we had sixteen facilities at the at the current time. So, and 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 how many? Uh, they, they get 10 days, don't they, at eight, or 10, 10 performances? Is that what the limit is for a charity? They get a maximum of 10. That is correct. Some rooms run uh, slightly less than that. They might run a seven-day uh, calendar as opposed to 10, but you're, you're correct that charities get up to 10 days. Just one further question. So you could have two thousand in excess of 2,000 performances in a calendar year. Is that correct? I believe that's correct, Senator. I would I wouldn't have gone to law school if my math skills were good, but um, <laughs> I believe that's correct. But you don't you, you don't have to, you don't have to be an expert in in math <laughs> to be a lawyer. It's just making sure that your bill is correct at the end of that's your career. That's correct. <laughs> so so just just one one further question and the with, with, we're talking about the, these machines coming on online. And they, the machines are, are, are limited to to a number of facilities, correct? The number of facilities that had licenses uh, based on a, a time a time situation. So, how many of these charities that uh, are, are in the charitable gaming situation will be able to take and take advantage of the machines as part of as part of their activities going forward? Uh, thank you, Senator. My understanding is that um, essentially all of them uh, will be eligible, um, that they are going to run concurrently with their um, with their their current game dates. And um, the bill, as I understand, with respect to historic horse racing, has those facilities running two charities at once. So um, essentially the um, uh, capacity for um, charities to uh, engage in charitable gaming is going to be um, uh, is going to be increased with that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Any further questions? All right, John. I, I um, do you was gonna, do you have current currently have any investigators per se in uh, and if if you do or don't either way are they going to require any training? We. We do currently have five investigators. Um, our head of investigation is a former uh, police officer as is one of our uh, investigators. Um, we may uh, need to take advantage of some training uh, with respect to um, particular um, uh, background investigation software and services, um, um, but we do have a training budget, I believe that we're able to address outside of this particular uh, legislation. Thank you. Any further questions? Hearing none, Ava, any other witnesses? 
So, Mr. Chair, I have no one else signed up to speak to this bill. So if anyone else under attendees would like to testify, this would be the appropriate time to virtually raise your hand or dial star nine. Um, and I do not see any hands, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Then at this time, we'll close the hearing on House Bill 533. And we will open the hearing on House Bill 565, Establishing a Committee to Study Charitable Gaming. And we would recognize the sponsor or sponsors thereof. Representative Ames, you should be all set. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Welcome. Okay. Hi. Um, so I'm here as the prime sponsor of HB 565, um, and I'm introducing that to you. Um, I think the first thing I should say is that this bill, HB 565, is almost ex identical to the provisions that are in part four of your Senate Bill 100. And Senate Bill 100, you may remember, and this uh, it has been passed by the Senate and sent over to the House, and I believe is now lodged or has arrived at the uh, Legislative Administration Committee. Um, so that's a uh, context for you to consider. This bill has been passed by the House on the consent calendar after receiving a 24 to 0 uh, vote of. Uh, of endorsement support uh, by the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, and uh, what both of these bills, uh, both the Senate version and the House version um, would set up is a committee to study charitable gaming in the broadest sense of the word. Um, looking at all aspects, many of which you've just been discussing by the way, and relationship to the previous bill that was before you. Um, that uh, so many questions that arise in the context of charitable gaming. I think we're all, um, I know House Ways and Means receive several bills on charitable gaming each year um, that, are, that target one particular or another particular and ask us to make a judgment on that particular. And uh, we, we generally don't get the larger context. The idea here is to look at that whole larger context. So for example, uh, historic horse racing, which may go through this year, um, uh, is sort of a hybrid in terms of its legal, uh, where it lands legally. We've got uh, 284, which is the original um, horse racing statute. And then we've got 287, which is where charitable gaming resides. And, uh, horse, and this uh, historic horse racing has, has both, uh, it's, it has its feet planted in both of those bills. Um, and uh, so I think there's, an, there's really a fairly, uh, serious need for a hard look at how this all works out. Who are the charitable organizations that are eligible for uh, participating in, uh, as uh, beneficiaries of charitable gaming? Uh, that's one of the questions that comes up. We've got two bills that are, ask us to expand the definition of charitable gaming. Um, and our look at those have brought out the fact that there's a a different statutory definition for bingo and lucky seven than there is for uh, charitable games of chance. Um, why and uh, what should we do about it? One of those bills asks that we uh, sort of add to the list of uh, charitable organizations, uh, I think a, a charitable trust. Uh, well, is that appropriate or not? Hard for us to figure that out in the time allotted um, another, another bill added us to add to the string of 501c uh, organizations that are eligible for bingo and lucky seven, another 501c friends 
G or something like that. Um, and should we do that or not? So we need to look at that. We need to look at how charitable organizations are selected to participate as beneficiaries. How, what's, what's the uh, waiting list uh, criteria? Or what, are the, what are the criteria for choosing one charitable organization over another um, at the local level? <clears throat> These are important questions. They're very important questions. They're uh, enabling a uh, private entity to receive money that is generated because of uh, the structure of gaming that we've set up. Um, and there are many other questions that I think are important. If we could have a good, hard look at this under the auspices of a committee specifically um, set up to do that, um, we might get some answers that would uh, suit us all, help us all uh, do a better job with this. So I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. I, I hope uh, we can, uh, I think I think the task before you, A, is of course to determine whether this is something you want to support, but B, um, figure out how to, how to uh, handle those two bills and uh, how to go forward so that we get to uh, get to the end with something that uh, becomes law. I'll leave it at that. All right. Any questions from members of the committee? Representative, uh, I have a question. Um, you said it's a slight diff slightly different from uh, part four of Senate Bill 100, which is currently in the possession of the House. Do you have a sense of what those differences are? Or that yeah, I, 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 thank you. I, I can tell you exactly. Um, the composition of the committee is the first thing. There, uh, Both bills call for three House members and two Senate members. Um, so they're identical in that respect, but the Senate bill um, identifies the two senators as one from Ways and Means and one from the Finance Committee appointed by the president. And then uh, on the House side, you've got a similar difference the, with the Senate bill being more specific. Uh, in the House bill, it's just three members of the House of Representatives appointed by the Speaker. Um, in the Senate bill, it's uh, one of those three shall be from the Ways and Means Committee and one of whom shall be from the Finance Committee. And, um, and then the only other difference that I, I could uh, find was that the, uh, the Senate bill would be convened by the first name Senator and the House bill, the, the bill would be, the committee would be convened by the first na named uh, uh, House members. Um, after that, the committee itself would elect the chair. So there's not any substantive difference after that. Um, so that's where it stands. That, everything else is the same. Well, thank you very much for that. Any questions from members of the committee? Seeing no hands and no questions, I will thank you, uh, Representative Ames, for your testimony. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Yes. Any uh, next witnesses? Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner McIntyre has his hand raised. You're recognized to speak, Charlie. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Charlie McIntyre, uh, as you can imagine, we would have no opposition or objection to having this committee created. So um, happy to answer any questions you might have, but um, you know we're used to getting looked at, so no worries. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, so the last person we had signed up to speak was Representative Edith Tucker, but I do not see Representative Tucker under the attendees at this time. Um, so if there is anybody else who would like to testify, this would be the appropriate time to virtually raise your hand or dial star nine if you're calling via phone. And I do not see any hands raised, Mr. Chair. All right, at this time, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on... Um... House Bill 565. We may be able to get rid of some of these, uh, at least even this last bill, I think would be pretty easy to exec if someone make a motion. I'll make a motion for executive session. 
Is there a second? Second. 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 Okay. Uh, Dallas Sandro, second by Hennessy. Executive session. Senator Daniels. Yes. Senator Dallas Sandro. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And Senator Guida votes yes. So I think 565 is pretty much a slam dunk. Um, I, I, I unless you want to make some amendment to it. I, I well, I, I, Mr. Chair, I think we should pass it, but hold it and see what happens to 100. I'm, I'm always afraid of omnibus bills. I think our bill, the Senate bill, is a better bill because we, we define the, the participants on the committee. We bring in finance and we bring in ways and, and ways and means, which I think are the two committees that will be, I, I think, most important for the for the uh, <clears throat> For the overview of charitable gaming, uh, so I'm very leery of, about, um, as I said, omnibus bills. So we we hold this bill, find out what happens to Senate Bill 100, and then we can move forward. That, that would be my suggestion. So with that, I would I would move on to pass on House Bill Six Five Sixty Five. I would second it. All right, uh, Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for Senator D'Alessandro. Yes. Since you think your bill is a better bill, and I don't question that, do you would you rather replace the language in this bill with, well, with could, SB one hundred? We could we could do that. We could amend it to 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 make it uh, the exact situation. Then I uh, <clears throat> sure. Of course, then I then I worry about both bills going down. <laughs> Yeah, always you know, a, it, it's always a concern of, of, of mine, but, but indeed it's a, it's a good suggestion. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't oppose it, but, but I could, think the other thing, holding it and, uh, and seeing how it works out, I think makes sense too. All right. Well, do we, do we want to not exec on this and just wait? Well, that's, uh, I, I would say, okay, Sure. They, we'll see how fast they how fast they're going to work on Senate Bill 100. That, well, that yes, that would be good. Our other oh, option well. is to pass it out of committee, and take it, it to the floor and table, table it, and then take it off the table by the beginning of June, yeah. if necessary. But when, that when would does, get it out of yeah, your right. brain. When, when, when does the House <laughs> meet? When does the House meet again? They aren't going to meet. I don't think they've said. Right. So then I, I thought they weren't going to meet in the month of May. So, so maybe passing it and tabling it makes the most sense of all. We just need two thirds to get it off the table. No, we will, if we get it off by the deadline, then we don't need two thirds. Right. Right. But I mean, would that make it easier for a committee workload to just get it out of here? Uh, that I, yeah, Sonia is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and as I'm as I'm thinking about the changes on it, really, you know, the Senate President is going to he'll do he'll be the appointer of the two members, and I'm sure it's just his discretion. I'm sure that Chuck would go ahead and and uh, and and do as as our bill asks when he makes those appointments, regardless of which version passes, right? I think sure. So. All right, so I just want to make a motion on this bill. Then I'll move on to pass. Second. Okay, okay. D'Alessandro and Rosenwald moved and seconded. Ought to pass on Senate Bill, I'm sorry, House Bill 565. Further discussion? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. Senator Daniels. Yes. Senator D'Alessandro. Yes. Senator Guida says yes, unanimous. Um, Could I suggest we put it on the regular calendar? It's going to be on the regular if calendar. If we're right. going to hope to table it. Right. Right. And, and okay. I'll be willing to take it out. All right. Easy enough. All right, let's go over to. 533, we have some changes in there that, that uh, I'd like to discuss. Um, I'd like to look at 
and I want, uh, they need your input on, on your thoughts on this. Uh, fines and penalties. I'm nervous about gel car. I just, uh, I don't impugn any negative, you know, any bad motives, but I think I'd rather have that done statutorily. Um, and I certainly welcome your comments on that. I thought he said that the fines were in statute already. Am I incorrect? He did, did but did, then did some, some Forty make that statement. Gary, go ahead. Uh, Senator Alessandro, he did state that the fines are in statute, and then Senator Guida read out of Section Three, Roman numeral Seven, uh, that that uh, right. The lottery shall adopt in rules. Right. So I'd like to strike that fines and penalties wording out of section seven under part three. Okay. That, that, if that's done, then what's in statute would be what we, what is retained, correct? Right. Yeah, sure. All right. I would um, like to add the 287 references right. throughout the bill, but I, I think we'll need some help. Right, as to been. exactly which sections maybe the Lottery Commission could help us update the references. Or the OLS, I mean, they typically, yeah. yeah. Well, charitable game, the horse racing the, is going to add a, a significant bump here. So I think the, this... The statutory change that you're suggesting said he makes sense. But I mean, I'm willing to work with OLS and the lottery to okay. get the right references for charitable gaming. I'm sure Mr. Newman will be helpful <laughs> to if you would like me to do that, Mr. Chairman. Sure, why not? Yeah. Okay. Good. Excellent. And then there was a reference made, and I saw it, but I can't find it now. Page two, line seven, about 45, the word days was missing. I couldn't find that either. I, I see days in my version. I wonder Me if there's too. a different version going around. Well, I think the House Amendment that's in I've our- got in, I've got it in the goalie amendment. Uh -huh. Yes, but, but then when the House, when you read the bill is amended by the House, it looks to me to be correct, but that wouldn't, wouldn't harm to have more sets of eyes confirm that. Yeah, yeah, at 45 is right, without dates. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it right. seems like we've been working off of the version as amended by the House, and it does say days. It does, right. So yeah, they think yeah. they probably corrected it before okay. sending it over. All right. Is there anything else that I should look to do besides... Put in the references to charitable gaming, take out and a schedule of fines and penalties from page two, line 25, and make sure days is in there. No, I think that's all I have on my list. Any yeah. other any other senators have any? Uh, Aaron, go ahead. We are going to... Um take out the schedule of fines and penalties, are we going to put in there what we actually want? I think it's already covered in statute. We did uh, mention a different RSA. Okay, so just reference I didn't that. Didn't write down we'll check words. on that. Yeah, we'll check on that for sure. Okay. And scratch line 20, uh, well, the line 19 through, through 23. We eliminate. Well, we want to have rulemaking on the processes for investigation. You just yep. wanted to take out rulemaking on fines and penalties. Right. Right. Okay. That's 21. I can just can't see the legislature defining an investigative process. <laughs> well, not as um, well. <laughs> so what am I taking out? Just 25? Just those words on 25? Just fines and penalties, yeah. Um, okay, I'll work with the Lottery Commission, OLS, and I'll check with Rick Newman. Is there 
<laughs> okay. All right. So hold on that one. And can I draft that as a committee amendment? Sure. Um, I, Senator, I think it, you would have to draft it in your name. Your name. Okay. And then once you bring it once. back to us and the committee adopts it, then I'll just have them switch it to a committee amendment. Okay. Is that okay? If it's in my name, does anybody else want to be on it with me? Sure. I'll get on it. Great. Thank you. Okay, All right. Could, so now up to. Can we do 3.30? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd move on to pass at 3.30. There a second? Second. Second by Senator Hennessy. I had uh, prepared an amendment to strike the 10 locations, but being as there's only two currently, and they said three more, uh, you know, they can look at changing that in a couple of years. And, and mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of the distinction in the types of betters. There's so much I don't know about that. <laughs> Well, the, 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 so I'm okay the, leaving it the way it is. Yeah, I think okay. so. Uh, it's uh, gambling has taken on an entirely new look in terms of how, what you can wager on and how you can wager. Uh, and you can wage, there are just so many different nuances associated with, with wagering. And that's why the ability to do it on the, <clears throat> on your, on your app is so important. So that's why the tier two is there, I believe. Gary? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do support uh, adding in the tier two, but I will vote against the bill because I do not believe that the state should be in the uh, process of picking winners and losers. If you had a community that decided that they want sports betting, then what, uh, what this is saying is that you can't have more than 10 people. Uh, do that. It's it's the reason I have always voted against uh, Senator D'Alessandro's gaming bills because I don't I don't think that the 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 state should be in the business of picking those winners and losers, but should offer opportunity to anyone who wants to participate in it. So for that reason, I would vote against it, even though I do support adding in the tier two. Cindy, was your hand? Okay. Yes. No, I was just thinking when Senator Daniels raised that question during the hearing of what, is there anything else that we limit the number of licenses on? And it occurred to me that um, we do that, for example, with the medical marijuana licenses, we do cap how many, um, and we've made changes to allow for more of them, but um, I think that the, the public policy we felt was right was that we didn't, we wanted to manage proliferation, exactly. at least in that. So you may not think it's analogous, but it was an example that came to me during the hearing when you brought that up, Senator, sure. Senator Daniels. And, um, so I just put that out there as we we have done that yeah. with agreement of the legislature. And there's always been a lot of conversation about proliferation that, that as as it relates to gaming, but uh, and and I, and I think that this is uh, this is a reasonable expectation given given the given the fact that you have ten. There are two in existence. There are three more to follow. And if 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 uh, you wanted to take the lid off, it could be done at a later time by the legislature. You know, I, I always go back to the fact that uh, we'll, we will have gaming uh, in, in, in every corner of, the, of our state if we don't watch out. To get, you know, we'll, we have to, uh, the ability to have 2,000 performances for charitable gaming over the course of a year at 16 sites, that's fairly, that, that, that's pretty good proliferation, I would say. Of course, with sports betting, we've got it everywhere. And there's the internet. I mean, so, again. Right. Well, that's the sports. And sports hopefully betting. we'll have it in Nashua soon. <laughs> the sports bill. All right. Any further discussion? All right. Um, 
So I would take somebody moved and who moved in second? Aaron? I've moved. I think Aaron second. Did yeah. You, I yeah, I just, sorry, I just to Gary's point, I wouldn't be opposed to striking out the 10 sports book retail locations. Your, what your amendment does, Senator Guida. Okay. It, it wouldn't cause any harm to do it. Nope. You know, just think about proliferation. That I mean, I, I don't have any opposition. Listen to that. I, I don't have any opposition to, to it. I, I think we've, we've already crossed the Rubicon here, kid, and there's no coming back. All right. There's no coming back. All right, then, at that, with that said, let me go find my amendment. We'll bring it up for consideration here. Yeah, okay, so I would introduce Amendment 1119S for consideration. And that strikes the 10th. Okay, seconded by Rosenwald. And that strikes, the, and only change it makes is to strike the 10 sports book retail locations right. at any time out. Any discussion? And hearing none, we'll take a vote. Senator Alessandro. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. Senator Daniels. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. And I'll vote yes. I better vote yes. <laughs> um, so it's unanimous. Uh, um, and. On the bill as amended. Okay. But to pass on the bill as amended. Second. Second by Hennessy. <clears throat> Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Daniels. Yes. Senator Alessandro. Yes. Senator, Senator Guida votes yes. I do recall to Commissioner McIntyre saying he wouldn't have a problem removing that. So, right. so. all right then, um, who wants to take that out? I'll take it out and uh, um, do we want to try consent? Yeah. Okay. I'll move consent. that. Moved by uh, Hennessy, second by Rosenwald on consent. Uh, Senator Rosenwald. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator D'Alessandro. Yes. Senator Daniels. Yes. Senator Guida votes yes. Gone to consent. All right. So now let's go over to. 154. Mr. Chairman, on this one, I would like to do a little bit more research. Okay, we can hold this. Yeah, and I'd like to look at that effective date too. Yeah. I had written down some concerns, some questions that I had. I, I, um, I'm always concerned about the impact on the taxes of the other taxpayers in the community. Right. Um, I I can't since this is meant essentially to go after um, existing blighted properties. I would use the term uh, amongst other things. It would, uh, you know, one would have to presume that by making these improvements, the tax value of the property is going to go up. You know, the question then comes, okay, if we're going to do a big multiple, if we're going to take a rundown big building and turn it into apartments, is that going to add more to the police, fire, EMS, uh, school, and other, uh, you know, tax, uh, or other services that provide, that produce the tax burdens? And uh, uh, I guess since it's, it's, it's locally driven, that's a question that the local authorities would have to take into consideration. Senator Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, back in my days on the, um, the county executive committee for um, when I was in the house, um, I was just surprised. So this is my first time on ways and means. And I was just surprised that um, it affects the county taxes as well. And I, 
I just don't know that that seems fair to the other towns that would have to pick up that um, when they didn't choose to do it. True. So obviously this, this merits more study, but go ahead, uh, Senator Rosewald. Thank you. Some of these places might be um, for profit businesses that develop um, these properties. And so I was wondering whether it would increase um, the state tax collections on the B BPT and perhaps the BET too. So I, I guess, while there are local impacts, there might also be state impacts on revenue. That would be positive, you're saying. Yeah. 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 All right, well, we'll all do our research and, and uh, our specific questions and issues and, and we'll come back to this, uh, would next week be too soon? To revisit it? Just for planning purposes, I'm trying to. That should be fine for me. Yep. All should right. work out. All right. Then we'll hold this for uh, further study by the committee. Um, any other business to come before the committee? Hearing none, I'll take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Oh, we, we got to come out of executive. Out of executive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. moved uh, out of executive. Second. Second by Rosenwald. All, okay. Uh, Senator Hennessy. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. Senator D'Alessandro. Yes. Senator Daniels. Yes. Senator Guida. Yes. All right. Now. Um, Move to adjourn. Okay. Doctor second. Second. Second by Rosenwald. All okay. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator D'Alessandro. Yes. Senator Daniels. Yes. And Senator Guida votes yes. All right. Um, See you all at one o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I got to get down to Concord here. You bet. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for good work. Thank you, Thank you Ava and, and uh, Sonia. Um, and Sonia, I want to call you right after this. So uh, don't go away. All right. I won't. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs>